Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors, endless stories. Friends in Fiction is a Facebook Live program with five best-selling novelists whose common love of reading, writing, and independent bookstores bound them together with chats, author interviews, and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Best-selling novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. At the start of the pandemic, they got together for a virtual happy hour to talk about their books, their favorite bookstores, writing, reading, and publishing in this new uncharted territory. They're still talking, and they've added fascinating discussions with other best-selling novelists. So join them live on their Friends and Fiction Facebook group page every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, or listen and view later at your leisure on their podcast or on their website at www.friendsandfiction.com. Hi, everybody. Before we dive in tonight, I just want to take a second to say that we are all praying for peace and hope across the aisle, across the nation, in this great country of ours. You know, Friends and Fiction is the place of refuge for us, and we hope that it is for you, too. Now, um, we're just going to go forward and say Happy New Year, everybody. Thanks for starting off the year with us on Friends and Fiction where we celebrate books and friendship and independent bookstores. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm your host tonight. And my upcoming novel is The Newcomer, out May 4th. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey, and my next novel is Under the Southern Sky, which releases April 20th. Hi, I'm Mary Alice Monroe, and my upcoming novel is The Summer of Lost and Found, and it's coming out on May 11th. And I'm Patty Callahan Henry, and my upcoming novel is called Surviving Savannah, and it comes out on March 9th, which is nine weeks away, which is crazy. So exciting. Yeah, we're excited for you. Now, you'll notice that we're missing one of the five tonight. Kristen Haramel isn't with us, but I want to assure you that we didn't kick her off the island. <laughs> she had a long-standing previous commitment, but she will be back with us next week. Now I'm thrilled to tell you that tonight, Friends in Fiction has our first official sponsor. We welcome and thank Mama Geraldine's Bodacious Foods. Not only is Mama Geraldine's the maker of the world's most delicious cheese straws, they're also a woman owned business and we really like to get behind that. Yes, we are so excited that this episode of Friends in Fiction is sponsored by Mama Geraldine's. And I'm actually sitting here um, chomping on them right now on the cheese straws. They are so delicious. Uh, Mama Geraldine, Geraldine sent us all a big box of goodies over the holiday. And um, I kept posting about them, especially they're known for their cheese straws, but I'm obsessed with their cookies. The key lime is the only flavor I have left right now, um, but oh, the pecan cinnamonies will change your favorite. life. That's my favorite. Change too. your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, high maintenance, Patty. <laughs> um, I need gluten free. And when we first heard about them, I was like, oh, everybody's going to get to eat the cheese straws except me. But hello, <laughs> gluten free in a heart. And they're oh, so good. I'm eating, I've had the regular and the gluten free. And I mean, I can't even tell, tell the difference. difference. Yeah. They're amazing. Okay. Honestly, confession time. I usually make uh, the powdered sugar almond cookies. Some people call them wedding cookies. And then <laughs> we got all, we got them in this collection. They're better than mine. So I didn't make them. <laughs> That's so thanks That's for building. <laughs> You're off the hook now. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we've got an exclusive offer for all of our friends and fiction viewers. You can get 20% off your online purchase at mamageraldines.com with the code FAB5, all caps. Snack on, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, love I know. I like to say snack on, y'all. Snack on. <laughs> and now let's get on with tonight's show. Yeah, there she is. 
you know, this is Friends and Fiction, and tonight it's such a pleasure to have my old dear friend, New York Times USA Today and London Times bestselling author Diane Chamberlain. In addition to her latest novel, Big Lies in a Small Town, which is just out in paperback this week, Diane is the author of 27 novels published in a dozen languages, including Necessary Lies, The Silent Sister, The Stolen Marriage, and The Dream Doc. Doctor, doctor. <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah. Um, and our indie bookstore tonight is Quail Ridge Books. And I think we have all had some amazing signing with our friends at Quail Ridge Books. Each week we ask our guest author to choose a favorite local indie bookstore for you to support. And Diane wisely chose Quail Ridge Books in Raleigh, North Carolina, where she lives. Now, QRB, as we call it, was founded in 1984 by the late, beloved Nancy Olser, Olson, who was a friend to so many authors like Diane and like me. Di Nancy was a true author matchmaker, and actually she introduced us years ago when I was living in Raleigh. We hope you'll browse their specially curated page on the store's website, featuring, Di featuring Diane's two most recent books, the Fab Five's forthcoming 2021 titles, which are all available for pre-order, and one highlighted backlist title from each of us. And you can get a discount on these and other titles, plus a lot more perks if you join the store's Quail Ridge Readers Club. And even though I live in Atlanta, I'm still a member of QRB Readers Club. I know all of us are hoping the pandemic will soon be behind us so we can all go back to signings and events at Quail Ridge Books. Right now, ladies, the New Year's, the holidays are over. Even being optimistic, it looks like we're Dr. Fauci says we're still a few months down the road from universal vaccines. I All five, you know, I, I, I was like, should she be on here? Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> She's just playing coy. Thanks for coming. Uh, Diane, I was just, just saying that all of us are used to being on the go and traveling for work or for pleasure. So I thought I would um, get the ball rolling tonight to ask everybody, where is your first dream destination once we're safely out of lockdown? Now, Diane, are you going to go anywhere? I mean, I know where you like to go. I would, I am dying to go to California to see my granddaughters. Yeah. Oh, that's the real yes. frustrating thing is they can't yeah. come here. I can't go there. I'm sure some of you are in the same boat. Yeah. Uh, and it's really, that's really tough. So that's where I would go. Yeah. Oh, grandchildren. Yes, 100%. Mary Alice, where are you going to go? I was supposed to go back to London this year and I I'm, I'm really miss it. So I go to London, but if they're still under lockdown, Next year, I think I'd go to the Grand Canyon and take my grandchildren there. I have never seen the Grand Canyon. I mean, I, really? I mean, Christy, oh, we yeah. have to go. This we is have to go. And our kids What's going in the Grand Canyon? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> We're all going to the Grand Canyon. Do they have wineries in the Grand Canyon? <laughs> Just ask them. <laughs> no, oh, but I think they have wine. <laughs> Are you asking for a friend? Or <laughs> nice. Yeah. Diane, hey, Christy. Come with us. <laughs> yeah, Christy, do you have a um, dream destination? Well, we were supposed to be in the British Virgin Islands from the day after Christmas till like January 3rd or 4th. And of course, we changed our trip. So I'm really looking forward. We rescheduled it for next Christmas. So I'm just really excited. I'm already like, okay, next year, it's going to be better. Things are going to be better. So I really hope they are because we were so excited about going. What about you, Patty? You know, when Diane mentioned grandkids, yes. I mean, I just spent, Diane, I just got to spend three weeks with my grandbaby, but I hadn't seen her in a really long time. And so the first thing, you're right, the first thing I would do is fly out there. They live in Hawaii. And I have not gone in over a year and or a year and a half. And I would I would go out there and spend time with them because this is just too much not moving and not seeing people. And that's the first thing I would do. Yeah. Yeah. And, oh, where, I guess I'm there. <laughs> I am dying. To, I'm dying to go to France. We had to postpone our planned trip to France last Memorial day to attend my friend. And, and Diane knows my friend Beth from Raleigh. 
her daughter was supposed to get married over Memorial Day weekend. And of course we had to cancel and they had to postpone the wedding, but we kept the flight credits and we are crossing our fingers that we'll get to France soon to drink wine and to see the beautiful countryside. My husband is planning on visiting some wineries and Beth has promised to take me to her favorite brocants. So that's, that's what I'm yearning to do. Can I add okay. my answer to yours? Can I just yes. come to France? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Friends in well, Fiction we, live from France has a nice there, yeah. <laughs> live from our live from our villa in, in Provence. There you go. I'll we'll bring an interpreter. Mm -hmm. Who speaks oh, French? No, we're gonna have to have a French interpreter. Oh, soon. okay. Well, we'll if, if, if we brother. bring Beth, uh, her daughter speaks French. Okay, we're gonna talk about Diane now because this is Diane <laughs> tonight. <laughs> Diane Week publishes weekly set of Big Lies in a Small Town, Chamberlain's depictions of creative beauty and perseverance across time and in the face of inevitable obstacles will keep readers turning the pages. And I wholeheartedly agree with this assessment. And, you know, I finally, I, I got behind with stuff, but I finally read the dual timeline stories of Anna Dale in 1940 and Morgan Christopher set in 2018. And I couldn't help but be drawn into their world and into the world of an artist. And I know that you are not that. You are a lot of things, but you're not a visual artist. And I knew a little bit about the backstory of Big Lies because you and I brainstormed it a couple years ago. That's right. When we the did Ebb our writer wow. retreat mm -hmm. at Ebb Tide. But could you give everybody the elevator pitch that I already know? Yeah. Um as you mentioned, it's set in the past and in the recent present 2018. And it's two women, one who in um, 1940 learns about a contest to create one of the WPA murals. You see them in post offices, usually government buildings, those old murals that are just to me kind of fascinating. Um, yeah. She wins a contest to paint one of those murals. The only thing is, she is from New Jersey. She's a northerner. And the mural is in Edenton, North Carolina. And she finds that she is not very welcome in town. And then we have a young woman, Morgan, in 2018, who's in prison for something she didn't do. And she is told that she can get out of prison if she will restore this old mural that has been found. Um, the only thing is she has no idea how to do restoration. So I have two characters who are kind of up a tree, uh, who have to deal with their circumstances. And Anna disappears during the painting of the mural. And Morgan, during the restoration of the mural, begins to uncover clues to Anna's disappearance. So that's kind of it in a very tiny nutshell. So good. Patty, you got a question. I do, Diane. It's so good to see you. It's so good to see you. So I often say that being it's a so novelist. It's so good to see you too. Have fun. I, I can't wait till we're all face to face in real life, in real time. I mean, this is as good as we can get, but it's not good enough. So I often say that being a novelist is a little bit like being a pretend psychoanalyst but you really were a psychotherapist and I just play one on the page. And you had, a, you were a psychotherapist with a specialty in adolescent counseling. And it seems like in all of your novels, but especially in this one that we're talking about, you have this really profound understanding of emotional issues. You don't just you don't just delve into their feelings. You actually dive down into the true issues, where they came from, how they got there. Anna Dale's mom is manic depressive. Both Morgan's parents are, can we say, functioning alcoholics. So, do these is issues choose you, or do you deliberately say, "I'm going to address this" or "I'm going to address that," mm. with the deep knowledge you have as a psychotherapist? That's a really good question. Um, you know, when I think about writing a book, I think about the situation first. In other mm -hmm. words, I wanted to um, have somebody 
paint this mural. That I knew that's what I wanted to do. And then I try to think of a character who is going to have the most difficult time doing what I want her to do. Ah. So that's where the character of Anna came from. And by making her a northerner, that gave her one obstacle. By making her um, uh, from raised by a depressive mother, that gave her another obstacle. And of course, throughout the story, as things start happening to her, the town towns you make sure things are happening to her, she begins to wonder if she has um, inherited her mother's manic uh, depression. And, and then with Morgan, you know, I knew that I wanted um, somebody who didn't know how to restore a mural, but what else could I throw at her? So I gave her, I gave her prison. I gave her, um, an alcohol problem that she pretty much has picked up, inherited, whatever, from her parents. So it's not that I set out to create these screwed up characters. It's that as I'm writing, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how I can make life more difficult for them so that they have to really work harder to mm. succeed. Because we all want our characters to, to succeed. I always want, um, I want them to have a happy ending. Happy endings are pretty important in my books, but they really, really have to work hard for those endings, like most of us. And I have to say that Diane has on more than one occasion um, psychoanalyzed my characters when we were at writer's retreats, right, Diane? She's great at that. Oh, I, I, I had a character. That's so fun. I had a character when I was writing uh, Summer Rental. We were all together. Um, we had a group, a wonderful group of North Carolina writers, and we would go to go away together and, and brainstorm and write. And I had this character. She was an outsider, and I couldn't figure out what why she couldn't connect with these women. She comes into a house of women, and she can't connect with them. And Diane went like that. She knew exactly what her I'm issue. That's so was. awesome. I know. You should hire yourself out as as like a book yeah. shrink, Diane. <laughs> A book train. Well, that would be totally. I would totally hire you. Yeah. Okay, Christy, you've got a question. <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I just have to say, and Diane, I know I've told you this, but just so everyone else knows, this book is so amazing. I've recommended it to everyone on every list I've written. I just love this book so much. And I actually was lucky enough to get an advanced copy of it. Thank you. And I remember I finished reading it and I was like, I wish that I had written this book. This book is so great. Um, so I just wanted everyone to know how much I love it. And if you have not read it, you need to, because it's so fantastic. Um, but this book and almost all of your books seem to hinge on issues of social justice. Can you talk about the importance of those issues to you and to the sort of emotional core of your stories? Yeah. Um I think it goes back to where and when I was brought up, which was New Jersey. And um, in a small, well, medium-sized town that was racially and religiously diverse, something I've always gonna be thankful for. And it was during the civil rights era. era. So, um, so I had an exposure to social justice issues from an early age. It wasn't in my family. Um, my family was um, not particularly on the same side as me, but I felt it very strongly. I felt it in the, the kids around me in my high school and what they were going through and what they were dealing with. And I felt it, um, you know, out on the street that in the town I was in, there were riots and there were peace marches, and uh, I was influenced by all of that. So it's not that I set out, once again, it's not that I set out to intentionally um, write about social issues. It's just that that's sort of where my, where my mind goes. And unfortunately, we still have plenty of them to deal with. So, yes. um, so I do find that 
that I go there. And even, you know, when people say to me about big lies in a small town, how there's a lot of racial issues, I'm like, oh, there is. Because to me, it's just so much a part of life and a part of um, Anna and Morgan's lives in the story that I don't really separate it out in my own mind. It's just um, part of the territory. It's part of the story. It's really, really well done too. It really is. And I think that's why it works is that mm -hmm. thank you. That, it's in your mind. Mm -hmm. And it's actually uh, sort of a segue right into my question. So Kathy, I'll just jump right in. It's um, the story is set in um, Edenton, North Carolina. So in the deep South. And we've talked about this with other guests um, in different ways. It's a challenge to write of sensi with sensitivity and even without, with, without fear of repercussions about Black Lives Matter issues. And you, in this book, you have um, this character monitoring a gifted young Black art artist. So you get into those issues. Did you worry about that? And if, if so, how did you deal with that challenge? Because I think it is a challenge for that book to come out at a time yeah. when everyone is, is very sensitive and very aware of that sensitivity. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you, I wasn't as worried about it as I am now with the book that, <laughs> that I just oh, finished interesting. writing. Interesting. But yeah. Um, what, yeah, yeah. And that's, I'll, I'll get to that in a sec because that's a whole di different issue. But um, what I did was I really, there is a character, he's a young boy in 1940, who Anna kind of takes under her wing because she sees his artistic talent. And she wants to nurture it. So I know that I needed to um, do a lot of research in Edenton, it's Edenton, North Carolina, to find out you know, what life would have been like in 1940, and specifically what life would have been like for um, a young black boy in 1940. So I discovered a racial reconciliation group in Edenton. And this is a, a, a very, it was a very moving experience to me to um, visit this group. It was about 30 or 40 people, black and white, who have been meeting together for a number of years and who, um, who have really gotten past the hard questions to real friendships. So I was invited to visit that group and I met two older gentlemen. I no longer use the word elderly. <laughs> um, two older gentlemen, uh, African-American, who were willing to meet me for lunch. I met with them separately and let me pick their brains about what it was like for them growing up in um, the 40s in Edenton. So um, they gave me an awful lot of material to work with, and I hope that I was was true to um, to what I, as far as what I represented. But the book that I'm just that I've just turned in, which is called right now, it's called The Dark End of the Street, is has a lot to do with racial issues because it is about um, the Voter Rights Act in 1965. And young white people came into the South to register black voters. So right off the bat, um, we were in scary territory for a, a white woman to be writing about. Um, my two protagonists are white. And my editor and I have worked through some of the sticky things, things that we think are sticky. But um, we are going to sensitivity reader. She's actually reading it right now for me. And this is a Black woman, an editor, who will hopefully let me know where I'm on astray, uh, where I'm being offensive, where I'm not being strong enough. Um, my one concern with, with this movement toward being really sensitive, which I think is very important, my one concern is, is creating a revisionist history yeah. Um, oh, yes. Do we, you know, we do we not use the N word in that whole book? There's not the N word. And that's not really real. So I have a lot of concerns about it. And I'm very much looking forward to what this um, 
what the sensitive has to say. I think it's very interesting to think of what, I mean, as a, as a white woman writing about white people in that period in history, you have the voice for it in the history, but it's just such a sensitive time. And I'm, I know a lot of authors have yes. been concerned about that, but bravo for you to, I think if anyone could do it, Diane, you could. Oh, that's really sweet. Thank you, Mary Alice. Okay, so we know that um, you write about, you know, people say, well, write about what you know, but most of the time we're writing about stuff we don't know <laughs> anything about. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Diane, I know you're a gifted guitar player <laughs> and writer, but you know, in um, Big Lies in a Small Town, you're a non-artist and you're writing from the viewpoint of artists like Anna and Morgan. And, and how do you do that? Especially they ask the fairly technical aspect of fine art restoration. Tell me a little bit about, tell our, tell all of us about yeah, the research you're right. for that. You're right, I'm not an artist. You know, the game Pictionary, I can, if I have to say dog, if I have to get that across, I can't even draw a dog. So uh, I'm not a good artist. You're good at Scrabble, I, um, though. I'm a good researcher. I am good at Scrabble. <laughs> but um, she's she's trounced me at Scrabble I, before. I just did a ton. <laughs> I do a ton of research, um, and I love it. I love reading about um, artists, and there are many books on the WPA murals and how they were created and who the artists were and how few women there were. Uh, that's one of the problems that Anna is up against in 1940 is that she's a woman, which is really not considered, how could a woman be a good artist? So, um, so with regard to creating the, the mural, I learned a lot through research. And then with regard to restoring it, I had an acquaintance in this area in Raleigh who has a restoration company. And so she invited me over and she showed me the tools of her trade. And we talked about what Morgan would have to do to uh, restore that mural. And what I was most concerned about in both cases was boring the reader. Because you can get mm -hmm. so carried away with your research and how cool it is to create yeah. these things or restore this thing. So I had to kind of walk a fine line to get enough of it across to the reader without having them go, oh. Yeah. So I don't think they did. Hopefully I succeeded. Yeah, okay. I find anything to do with art and murals so fascinating. You could have kept on going. <laughs> it was so great. So we've had a chance to ask our questions, and now we are going to let our viewers who posted questions on the Facebook page, and, and a lot, Diane, a lot of your fans posted Oh, yeah. Questions. So, Patty, you've got a question that somebody left, right? I do, Diane. Victor First, I want to say, before I ask Victoria Brawley's question, that I'm thinking we're going to hire you, friends in fiction, book therapist, and you are going to come in and analyze all of our characters, and then our books will be deeper and richer for it. Are you up for that? I, I just need you to say yes on the show. I think you you do just fine, Patty. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So your question is, I couldn't, I couldn't make her say yes, you guys. Okay. Your, the next, next question is from Victoria Brawley, and she says, "Hello, Diane. I loved reading The Dream Daughter. In fact, I've loved reading all of your novels that have crossed my path. How do you ever come up with the twists in the story?" You can answer without spoilers. You are always so original and so creative with your twists. Uh, thank you so much. That's a great compliment. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I sit around. I don't know. What can, <laughs> That's what we say about everything. <laughs> what can happen next? You know, I, I really don't. I mean, it's that there's no secret to it. It's just imagining what what rocks I throw this character next and what will that rock lead to? And what if there's a rock underneath that rock that nobody knows about? Um, oh, and, and what I always tell people, you know, I, I create an outline and what I always say is that my characters never saw the outline. 
because you all know you're all writers. They, as soon as you start um, creating those characters on the page, they're doing things and saying things that you never anticipated. So what I always say is that when I, when a reader is surprised by something in the book, usually I was surprised by it too. Yeah. It's usually something that's come sort of organically from my characters and their story. Diane, I remember when you were telling us about um, the vision you had for the dream daughter and you said, you guys, I remember you. <laughs> you left. The I'm room. doing time travel. We went, no, no time travel. Awesome. <laughs> and only you could have pulled it off. Oh, thank you. <laughs> okay, who's got a question? Oh, um, Kristen. Kristen. I have one. <laughs> Yeah, Kristen's not here. It's just me. Um, so Jetta Helmstone wants to know, where do your storylines come from? And are your characters loosely based on people you have met? They are absolutely not based on people I've met. Not ever have I based a character on somebody that I know or I've met. And the reason for that is... Um, it's never crossed my mind. And I think it would be very limiting. When I was writing my first novel, which I don't recommend anybody read, I based the character really on myself. At first, she had my color hair, she was my height, she had the same job I had, which was at that time a, a social worker in a hospital. Um, and then I discovered I just couldn't make her do anything that I wouldn't do. So I completely changed her. I changed what she looked like. I changed her job. I thought, what is the what kind of character would be the least like me? And I made her an athlete, which is those of you who know me, that that is not me. And so then she really took off. So it was my little lesson in not basing a character on a real person because then it frees me up to make them do whatever I want to do. And I have to the tell you, getting sued. Getting sued <laughs> is a problem. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Um, but I have to tell you too that um, someone actually sent me a message on Instagram today telling me how much they, that they went back and read your debut novel and how much they loved it. So maybe you should recommend oh. it. <laughs> well, it has, um, it's just not like my later novels. It's, it's a story, you know, kind of a story with the beginning and an end and, and no deep surprises. Um, so I'm proud of it because it was my first novel and it actually won a big award from Romance Writers of America. Diane, but, um, that's when I met you. It was that very first book. I know. I, th I mean, I that know. we go back, girlfriend. And I met you, and when we, you walked in. We were in, baby were writers. Babies. And there were, but there was this aura around you that behind her, she won the gold. What is it, the golden heart? What was, what, is that the award? But it's it the, the big Rita. award. The Rita. <laughs> yeah, the, the Rita. big Rita was like, oh, my God, I want to talk to her. She won the Rita. Yeah, and yeah, it was well, like the Rita is deal. like the uh, Oscar. Well, uh, it is. For, it's a big for, deal. Romance, right. Mm -hmm. So you walked in the door, and I don't know how you felt about it, but we were in awe, my darling. So that was, and I loved the book. Oh, my God. I was I was so thrilled. However, um, it sort of pigeonholed me as a romance writer, which, as you know, I'm really not a romance writer. So it took a while to get out of that label. But yes. I was incredibly thrilled to have my first novel. Yeah, that um, happened to a number of it. us, you know, back then. And but I think it's because RWA. We've talked about this too. You know, you won a wonderful award for a category that would have been women's fiction later, a few years later, and um, it was mm -hmm. recognized. It's just such a wonderful novel, and it was um, yeah. share it. It was a great book is a great book still is and and mary alice i always think of you as um you know that we just knew each other when we were baby writers you know so such a long time 
I know it's so nice to see you and still be friends after all these years. My God, still you look pretty good there, <laughs> Diane. <laughs> You know, I always think we should, you know, at some point, we don't want to get too girly, but at some point we might want to say, Diane, what do you do to your skin? <laughs> How do you not have any wrinkles? Oh, okay. she got them. She Why has do you think the most beautiful this? skin in person. <laughs> she does. You're very sweet. And Thank I have you. seen her. I have seen her in the middle of the night. I have seen her early in the morning. She just has beautiful skin. <laughs> Mary Alice, you've got to read her book, right? Thanks. But I just also have to say, I remember Diane back in those days had this wildly thick, gorgeous dark hair. <laughs> <laughs> we all look so different back then. All right. Those sorry for my phone in the background. Oh, dear. So sorry about that. It'll take too long to drop the phone. Uh, this is from Michelle Cockburn, and she says, I have a question for Diane. Have you considered, okay, good. I have a question for Diane. Have you considered extending the Keeper trilogy into a saga? I'd love to read a novel based on Annie's upbringing from her point of view and through her marriage to Alec. I've just read the first two and have started Her Mother's Shadow and cannot get enough. Thank you. Um, Her Mother's Shadow, in my opinion, is the best of the three. So enjoy it. Um, you know, it's really funny because I wrote, Keeper of the Light was my fourth book. So I wrote it a long time ago and people kept asking for a sequel. So 11 years later, I wrote the second book. And then a year after that, I wrote the third book. And what was so much fun about it was I aged everybody 11 years. And I thought about what might have happened to them during these 11 years and, and wow. what would their lives be like now that I work with. And that was just tremendous fun. So it's been, I don't know, it's kind of close to 11 years. So I will think about that. No, it's it be fun to visit those that family again. You should. <laughs> Every 11 years, I'll write about them. Well, so you're going to pull a question off the Facebook page. Yes. Um, first, I wanted to read you a comment. Um, so Chantel Grady, who is a good friend of mine and a great friend of the show, for sure. She's amazing, wonderful reader in person. And she said, books always handle tough subject matter. Like all art, it holds a mirror up to society. Some can't handle looking at themselves. Mm -hmm. So kudos to you for trying to do just that, Diane. So that was a really... Um, she said that a, a few questions ago when you were answering and you were talking about, you know, diving into writing your next book. Um, Ethel Murchison Eckenstein wants to know why you chose to set the book in Edenton, North Carolina. Hmm. Well, a number of years ago, a woman came to my signing and she said, um, I'm from Edenton and you really have to come to Edenton, I know you're gonna find a story there. And so um, my significant other, John and I went to Edenton and she and her husband were so lovely and they took us around, we went out to dinner, we took the trolley through Edenton, we explored, we looked at the history, it's a really historical little town. And um, I had nothing, zip. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thanked her for introducing me to this lovely town and I just kind of put it aside. But when I started thinking about um, Big Lies in a Small Town and the murals, the WPA murals, the contest that, um, that Anna enters was a mural for each state in a very small town. So I thought, and this was a real contest, so that made me think of Edenton. And Edenton turned out to be absolutely perfect for this book because of the history and the industry and things that I could build into Anna's mural. Um, and it's just, it's a lovely little town. So um, so I got to go back and research it with a new eye. Now, once you're picturing your characters in a place, then you see it in a very different way. So yeah. that's how it came to be Edenton. Now, Christy, how far are you from Edenton? 
<laughs> I was going to say I'm pretty close. So I'm in Beaufort. So um, I don't know exactly, but 90 minutes, two hours, mm, not are. not far. But I mean, it's it's a similar area. It's weird how some of these places are close together, but they're difficult to access from each other. So sometimes you can look on a map and think, oh, it's right there. But it's it's really not. But Edenton is absolutely beautiful. And I loved reading about it. And you captured it really, really well. So, and it's, so um, is so is Beaufort. Beaufort yes, is wonderful. It is. It is a great little town. Do you it. ever find yourself in the position of sometimes I think, oh, I know this story can be set only in this place. And then sometimes I think I have a story and it's looking for a setting. Do you ever find yourself mm -hmm. doing that, Diane? A lot of times I have the setting first. Mm -hmm. um, obviously not with Edenton, but um, I really wanted to, God, I'm blanking on the name of the town. What's the little town um, on a river in North Carolina, of course? Uh, New Bern? Stolen Marriage? New Bern. <laughs> New Bern. <laughs> New Bern. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, I knew I wanted to set a book in New Bern because I wanted to go to New Bern. So um, sometimes I will pick, you know, like, oh, let's set a book in the Outer Banks so that I can go to the Outer Banks. Yeah. So sometimes the setting is the thing that comes first for me. Just New so Bern's a great there. setting. New Bern's a really good town. I lived there yeah. Yeah. for That's a few years. That's where Nicholas Sparks sets a lot of his books, books isn't it? Well, he yes. lives in New Bern. Yeah, yeah so um, maybe not New Bern. <laughs> <laughs> well, he but lives where, there. He doesn't where, was, um, where was Stolen Marriage set? Um, where was the Stolen Marriage set? Um, that wasn't a real town. In Hickory. At the Polio Hickory. Hospital. Hickory. Right. Yes. Well, with the yeah, and that was inspired because I was reading about North Carolina history, which is something I like to do in my spare time. And I read about um, the polio hospital that the town built themselves in 54 hours because of a, a pandemic. I mean, an epidemic of mm -hmm. um, polio in the town and the real hospitals were full. So I was fascinated that during World War II, when the able-bodied men were not even there in the town, that the townspeople pulled together to create this hospital. So that's what inspired the story. But then if you've read the book, you it goes off in all these directions that I never expected. Yeah, but it's really time. Uh, and time. the book we're talking about, y'all, is, is st a st uh, Stolen Marriage. And we'll put it, we'll put it in the links. It really is timely for this time period because people, yeah. there was such a stigma attached to polio at the time, right? Oh yeah. People were terrified of it. Yeah, there really was and there was no vaccine at that time. Right. How and, familiar uh, And it was just like yeah. children and people didn't really understand. Um, yeah. So it just and so the people like who worked in that hospital it magically got were, into your kids. Yeah, and the people who worked in that hospital were considered, you know, nuts, right? Because they were going to be that brave. Um, I don't think that there was much of that because uh, at that time it was mostly children, right, who were impacted. Oh, yeah. So I don't think the adults were terribly fearful. Um, okay. My character is an a nurse and she, her family does not want her working there because it's right. beneath her. Right. Um, but okay. she bucks them, of course. Okay, it's time for a writing tip. And we already know that Diane is an expert at um, psychoanalyzing characters. But um, <laughs> Diane, do you have a, even our, even our uh, readers and listeners who don't write, love to hear a writer's tip. Can you share one? I mean, you've done more than two dozen novels. You well, must this, have some secret. It's so funny that you should ask that question because whenever I'm asked that question, here's how I answer it. Well, my friend, Mary Kate Andrews, gave me the best tip that, uh, that I've ever gotten, which is you can't revise oh, what you haven't written. <laughs> 
honestly, that drives me because it's so hard to face that blank page. All of you out there who want to write, I understand how it feels, and it doesn't feel any better at book 28 than it does at book one. But it doesn't matter what you write, because then you're going to go over it and fix it, and eventually it's going to be something fabulous. But I got that from you. Yeah. So you have all heard her. that, Di we've, Diane. We've all heard that from her. And well, you so have a lot. <laughs> you have a lot more wisdom than I do. A lot more wisdom than I do. Okay, let's talk about what we're reading. You know, tonight I think especially, a lot of us need a place, a, a safe place to escape to, and I think books give us that. So, Mary Alice. Well, it's um, interesting. I am reading, let me make sure I'm putting, can y'all see this? This Tenderland. Yes. Now, oh. I listened to this book, um, the audio book. And by the way, it's one of the best audio books I've ever heard. And by William Kent Kruger. And he is our guest next Wednesday. So I thought I'd start reading the actual pages because it's a different experience. And it's so beautiful. It's John Steinbeck meets Mark Twain. And that mm -hmm. says a lot. And I hope you all read it. You have time to read it before the, the, the 13th when he joins us. But it's a tremendous audiobook and a tremendous read. And I highly recommend it. I'm listening to the audiobook right now. And I only have an hour left. And I keep not wanting to, because I don't want it to end. The narrator is extraordinarily good. Yeah. I agree. I'm starting it tonight. Yeah. So I'm yeah. excited. Diane, have you got your first uh, read it's of 2021? Actually, um, I'm about 15 hours into um, Barack Obama's Promised Land. <gasps> <laughs> it is a long book, and it's it's just wonderful, and I'm getting an education. That's great. I'm looking forward to it. Anybody else have a first uh, first read of 2021? Yeah, I want to tell you all about two books that came out yesterday. Um, you know, that it's been there's been so much going on. I think sometimes it's hard to notice what's happening in the new year. But um, Michael Ferris Smith has a new book out that came out yesterday. I think I mentioned it a few months ago, but it's called Nick. And it is about Nick from The Great Gatsby. And it is a prequel about his oh. life. The Great Gatsby. Super cool. And it's it's extraordinary. I'm just it's really good and atmospheric and and really wonderful. And then our friend who will be on the show later this year, Jennifer Robson's new book is out yesterday, and it is called Our Darkest Night. And what a great week for reading. So, right, um, everybody. All right, you guys. Ladies, how did you end your reading year? Naughty or nice? Ooh. <laughs> Very nice, because I'm listening to William Kent Kruger's Tender Land. I was, oh, nice. my last read of 2020 was The Clover Girls by um, our good yeah. friend Viola Shipman, who was oh, on the show. Yeah, I read that too. And it was naughty and nice. Moving <laughs> <laughs> about. I'll tell you what I watched. I watched Bridgerton, which was both nice, but woo, a little naughty. <laughs> Spicy. <laughs> Spicy. I know. I, I I was telling Meg, who is our, what do we call Meg? Our managing director. Our managing director. Our yeah. managing director. I was yeah. telling her after all of this explosion about Bridgerton, we need to have a Regency romance writer on the show, y'all. Let's Ooh, try and get yeah. Julia Quinn. Do you think she'd yeah, come? Yeah. I think it would well, be fun. Yeah. She has time. Um, okay. Um, Patty, do you want to remind everybody about our podcast? Absolutely. So as you all know, or if you don't know, one of the many ways to listen to our show, if you didn't make it for Wednesday night or you just want to re-listen because guests like Diane had such amazing tips and insight, is that we have a podcast. And all of our shows are on the podcast. And we also are starting to do extra episodes. 
and Mary Kay Andrews and Kristen Harmel interviewed two of our indie booksellers. And that is our first bonus episode. And we have loads more coming for you. So keep your ears and eyes open for those. That's right. And Mary Alice, I mean, you already kind of gave us a little peek this week, but tell us about William Kent Kruger. Well, this is, again, this tender land is William Kent Kruger, or we'll call him Kent, by the way, that he goes by his little name, will be here next week. And I have to say that this tender land is, if I was selecting the best book for 2020 for the read, it would be this book. The best one, mm -hmm. and then on the um, coming up after that on the twentieth, we have a fabulous just us episode, and I know a lot of our viewers enjoy those, and it's a very special one because we are going to tell you about our debut books, so stay tuned for that and to join in. We've invited two of our favorite debuts of the year, Sarah Penner and Nancy Johnson. So it's going to be a fun show. Oh, and also Pamela Terry. There's three days. Oh, now thank you. Yeah. Oh, we have even more to come. Oh, more reasons yeah. to come. Okay, we can't get enough of Diane. So Christy has one more question for you, Diane. I do. Diane, we have this question that we love to ask every guest on the show. And we are specifically interested in your answer since your brother is an author as well. So what were the values around reading and writing in your family growing up? And how do they how do you think they shaped you as a writer? Yeah, um, books were big. My father was a school principal, and every day he would come home and he would toss uh, a book and a candy bar or two on our bed. So I always say we grew up oh with um, we grew up with big readers with bad teeth. <laughs> so um, so yeah, I think I think we just grew up loving reading. For me, though, you know, most of the books that I was able to read as a kid were like the little golden books. Mm -hmm. But in the first grade, our teacher read us Charlotte's Web. And that was it for me that I, I had to be a writer who could make people laugh and cry like that book. It, it never occurred to me a human being could create something like that. Um, so mm -hmm. that was it for me. Love that. Did he continue giving you candy as you got older? And books? And books? Yeah, yeah my like parents reading. really knew nothing about nutrition. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they knew about reading. It's kind of genius, though, because you associate yes, the two in your mind. Like, if your kid doesn't like reading, throw him a candy bar every time. <laughs> Could create some problems later, but, you know. Oh, I love I love hearing that, Diana. And my that's brother. Great. One of the best answers we've ever had. I yeah. Right. Tell us about your brother. My brother was actually a writer before I was. And oh, wow. he's younger. So he beat me to it. And hit, and tell us his name. Oh, his name Your brother's is Arlo name. Presti, and he <laughs> writes mostly. Yeah, did did you get it? There's a Say it time again. lapse here. Yeah, um, Arlo Presti, and he writes mostly um, short stories, mysteries for like uh, Alfred Hitchcock magazine, that sort of thing. And right. he's written a few novels and some scholarly books. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for us tonight. Thank you, everybody, especially Diane, you, Diane. for joining us tonight. Um, thank you, so Mama. For having me. We loved having you next time in person. Thank you, Mama Geraldine's, for becoming Friends and Fiction's first snacktastic sponsor. And for all of you in the FNF universe, remember to use the code FAB5 at mamageraldine's.com to get 20% off on all online orders, stock up and snack on y'all. And we cannot wait to move into the new year with all these gorgeous new books that are coming up and amazing authors and hopefully happier times and fascinating discussions still to come. Good night. Good night, Diane. Good night, everybody. I love you, girl. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks for having Good night. me. Thanks Bye. for coming.